It's the Opperman Report. And now, here is investigator Ed Opperman. Okay, welcome to the Opperman Report. I'm your host, private investigator Ed Opperman. You can find me at Opperman Investigations and Digital Forensic Consulting through my website, emailrevealer.com, or you can just email me directly at oppermaninvestigations at gmail.com. Uh, our guest today is Anthony Daly, and he came to us through with uh, my Andrew uh, Loney. Uh, we just had the show the other day, uh, brought us Mr. Daly. He wrote a book called The Abuse of Power, A True Story of Sex Scandal at the Heart of London's Elite. So it's pretty much along those same lines that we've been doing with Richard Kerr and uh, Andrew Loney. Mr. Daly, are you there? It's a pleasure. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Tell us about yourself. Who is Anthony Daly? always wanted to work in a bookshop, and indeed, when I did leave school, that's exactly what I did. In a small bookshop here in Derry or London area, as it's known sometimes. Um, however, the bookshop was blown up, um, and um, there were various troubles, various things happened. I had lost a friend during Bloody Sunday in 1972. Um, but in uh, 1974, uh, around Christmas, I met a, a girl, and it was basically love at first sight. However, she was um, studying art um, in a college in England, and she returned after the Christmas holidays. Now, I decided that I wanted to continue and pursue this relationship, but I also decided that it was time to get out of Northern Ireland. I just couldn't take any more of the killings and the shootings, bombings day in and day out. So I applied for a job in a big bookshop. At that time, it was actually the biggest bookshop in the world. It was called Foyle's Bookshop, and it was in Charing Cross Road in London, and I worked in the antiquarian book department. So this was the beginning of a, a new life, a new career for me. Um, I was 20 years old at the time. So I moved to London, um, and very quickly, um, the, the, the dream became a nightmare. Um, the, I was there about a week, and um, it was a weekend that I was walking down Oxford Street, noticed a group of people around a table, and they were doing the old, um, the, the three cups and the ball routine where you had to guess where the ball was. Sure. So I watched this for a few minutes, so, and I had 20 points with me, and basically I was getting it right every time, identifying, and I was thinking, this is a great way to double my money. But of course, when I put the money down, he lifted the cup, and it was in a different cup. And I said right away, you know, this is a big mistake. Is there any way I could get the money back? And one of them called coppers and they ran away. So it was a complete scam. So I was completely penniless, um, didn't know what to do or who to turn to. Um, and I had a few coppers left and I made my way to Piccadilly Circus, which is around the heart of London. And I happened to see this amusement arcade called Playland. Um, I walked inside there. And I had nothing to lose. I had a few coppers left in my pocket, so I threw them in and lost everything. Um, so I decided to walk back out and hung over the railings um, at, uh, at, at the beside the railings outside the, the playland and basically wondering what would I do next. So this guy had followed me out from playland and he introduced himself as um, Keith Hunter and he said, we look a bit lost and we want your story. So I told him what had happened and he said, well, I'm really sorry to hear that. Um, I'm going to a pub to meet a friend of mine, a guy called Charles Hornby. Um, feel free to come along if you want to have a meal. And I said, but I really do, don't have money. Um, so he said, not a problem. Sort you out. He said, my mum was there, she wouldn't see um, stuck. So I went to um, this pub, met up with a guy called Char Charles Hornby, had a chat. Um, I was drinking Coca Cola. Um, we seemed to get on fine, and then they invited me to go for a meal. And during the course of the meal, they were basically asking me a lot of questions about myself you know, who, who I was, where I was from, what I was doing. Um, thinking back now, it was a sort of very polite interrogation. They were finding out everything about me, where I worked, my family. Um, and then they said, well, if you come back to my apartment, um, I can give you £20, you know, considered a loan, and we'll sort it out. So um, I had been drinking at this time. We just wine during the meal and went back to the apartment, and they insisted that I try more wine and um, porter and so on. Um, and basically I started feeling unwell and said, you know, I really need to get home. I'm not feeling well. So I said okay, and um, one of them went to get a coat, and as I was walking down the corridor to leave, I was dragged into a bedroom, uh, basically slapped about and forced down, and Charge Hornby uh, raped me. Um, that was utterly shocking and horrific, um, and I passed out, and wake up 
woke up the next morning and Hornby was there and basically as if nothing had happened. And I tried to get out and he, he said, look, I, we picked you up. We thought you were new on the game, that you were cruising. Uh, and I said, I mean, I, I had nothing to do with this. So that wasn't my intention at all. What I told you was true. And he was basically saying, yeah, they all say that. Um, but he said um, that he found me um, a bright young man, uh, very articulate. <clears throat> and he said, I would like to introduce you to some of my friends. I said I know some very important people um, who would um, like to spend some time with you. And I said, this isn't going to happen. This is going nowhere. You've got me all wrong. Um, he then um, tried to blackmail me. He said that he had taken um, indecent photographs of me when I was unconscious and that he could send these back to my family in Ireland and how would they respond. So I was panicking and I said, please don't do this, don't do this. Um, and they said, well, just think it over and we'll, we'll see how we get on. But um, they also informed me that they had actually drugged me that night. They said, you looked a bit tense, so we, we drugged you to put you at ease. Um, so that's what had happened. And then after that, they contacted me again. They visited the bookshop and started to threaten and intimidate. And I basically said, this is going nowhere else. I'm going to report this to the police. Um, now, I should explain that at that time uh, in England, there was an IRA bombing campaign going on, and there was a lot of um, ill feeling towards the Irish community in England and London at that time. And he basically said, you know, you have two choices here. We're, we're going to invite you to a party this weekend. If you don't go to that party, you'll find yourself um, in a police cell having a confession kicked out of you. So it's your choice. So I just felt totally cornered, and um, he said, OK, let's go. And he took me around London, and he had my hair cut. He bought some very expensive clothes, a suit, trousers, a shirt and tie. Completely, literally groomed me for this party at the weekend. And I went along to the party, and um, it was abandoned there. And it was a party basically um, thrown by an organization called the Monday Club which was a branch of the Conservative Party. Hmm. And they were essentially celebrating the fact that Margaret Thatcher was um, elected leader of the Conservative Party at that time. So very quickly, I drank as much drink as I could consume. The only thing that I wanted to do was get drunk and get through this. Um, but at that party, I was raped by a member of parliament. And that's when it started into the spiral. After that, um, I was pimped out of this amusement arcade playland and introduced to various people, more MPs, a couple of members of the House of Lords. But it wasn't just politicians, it was businessmen, prominent businessmen from the world of finance, from the world of publishing and insurance, um, and even the oil industry. Um, and this went on for a few weeks, and it was taking more and more drink and taking more and more drugs, um, basically just to get through it. Um, it really came to a head when I was introduced to, at a meeting to a group of people who were members of an organization called PI, which stood for the Pedophile Information Exchange. And they told me that um, I was being taken to the best show in London that night. So I ended up in a small apartment there, and there were a group of people who were waiting, having drinks and so on. And they proceeded then to produce two young boys. I was told they were brothers, aged eight and ten and they proceeded to sexually abuse these boys. I uh, swore at them and um, jumped off the seat and tried to stop it, but I then was sexually abused and attacked and raped again and beaten unconscious. So after that, um, I went to one of the guys that I was pinned to was a guy called Simon Hornby. Now, he was actually the brother, the older brother of Charles, and strangely enough, I got on quite well with him. We spent a lot of time talking about books and literature and history. So I felt, well, if I'm spending time with him, at least I'm not spending time with some of the people who are, um, shall we say, a little bit more perverted. So I begged Simon after that attack, could he release me from Playland? And he said he, can, he would do what he, he would try and do. So he succeeded. I don't know what the arrangement was, if I was sublet to Simon, but he, he me from Playland. The only problem was that he said, I now want you to sleep with some of my associates in my network. So it became a more pleasant and less torturous form of abuse, albeit still abuse. 
and he circulated me around and his associates. And it basically involved um, being taken to expensive hotels and restaurants around, around London, um, having dinner with these um, different men and then being sexually abused after it. So I just became totally brainwashed into this sort of life. Um, it was what I had to do to survive. I basically thought if I can survive being shot at and being blew up in uh, Northern Ireland, then I would get through this and something would happen. I would get out. Um, but my health was progressively getting worse and worse. I was in agony with back pains, which may have been from the couple of kickings that I had received, um, until finally um, I attempted to take my own life and begged Simon Hornby to let me go. So I think he, he, he didn't want me dying in bed with a client, so they, they finally let me go. Um, and this happened over the space of um, a number of months. But, I mean, it seemed, each week seemed like a month back then. It was a completely torturous and horrific. So you were, it was 20 years old when this started, so this was really... So it was 20 years old when this started. So less than a year? Less than a year? Yes. So how, how did you... Say, what, where did you go after this? Sorry, could you repeat that? Yeah, where did you go after this? All right, I came straight back home to Northern Ireland and basically locked myself away for a year, uh, hardly left the house. Um, but I did get a job then in uh, the local library service the following year. Um, but actually the next year, um, in um, October 1976, in the early hours of the morning, um, our house was raided by the British Army. And they said that they were looking for guns or explosives, but it was basically an excuse to turn the house upside down. And um, at that time, um, this was like a social housing. Um, the houses were rented, and the officer in charge had to fill out a little form. It was called a search damage claim form. It meant that you could go to your landlord and claim back money for any damage that had been done during the search. So he asked for me by name and tore off the slip and said, consider this a calling card from your friends in London. Hmm. So it was basically a warning. And one of the things I noticed after the search was that a lot of the little bits and pieces that I had brought over from London, such as uh, the business cards that various um, people had given me, were all taken. Uh, little notes with thank you, some bits of paper from the House of Commons had all vanished. Um, so that really sent me a message. It was quite alarming at that time to think that the army could come in and basically arrest me or do anything they wanted at that time. Um, so between that and 1979, I happily fell in love again and got married. And the year I was married, 1979, I was working in a school in Derry at that time. Um, in a school library, in fact. And one day out of the blue, um, this uh, um, politician who I had been with in London on three occasions walked in the door with the headmaster. He had been appointed to a position in Northern Ireland at that time, and he was doing a tour of the school, and I was asked to show him around the library and show him the various resources and so on. So we were walking a few feet ahead of the others, and he, he said, you didn't say goodbye. So I was completely shocked and astounded because, um, you know, at that time the war was going on in Ireland and if a member of um, Parliament was visiting anywhere, the security forces would have been told, the RUC at the time would have been told, and there would have been a big security operation. So I just felt that it was another um, way of saying, we can walk into your life at any time and do anything. But more shocking than that was, after I had shown him around, he was up at the top of the, the library with uh, some of the VIPs. There was the chairman of the board, who was a priest, and um, various people from the Parents Association, and the principal and the vice principal. So his private secretary came down and said he wanted to have a photograph taken with you. And I said, well, why on earth would he want my photograph? There's people up there that's, that are more important than me. But he insisted on having the photograph taken. And um, I actually have a copy of that photograph to this day, which I kept. But it was very disconcerting and very um, shocking to know that someone could walk into my life at that time. Did he try and make contact with you after the uh, the event or the school? No, I heard nothing more from him after that. Um, 
I half expected him to pass on a message from Simon Hornby on my behalf, but he didn't say anything. It was just basically, uh, you never say goodbye, and then let's have this photograph taken. I mean, essentially, it was a trophy photograph. They show his friends back in London, mm. and it was they sent me a message as well. So what was the next incident? Well, the next thing then, I basically had put this out of my mind, this out of my mind for a number of years. I had um, children and a family and had a career, so it all sort of faded into the past. I thought no more about it. Um, but in the early 90s to the late 90s, there started to be stories about abuse appearing in uh, news items um, involving the Catholic Church. And then some uh, reports started appearing about MPs and politicians being involved in abuse. And one Sunday I came across a newspaper headline to the effect that, you know, VIPs were abusing boys. And it sort of took me right back because when I read this article, it seemed that some of the people involved were basically still at it. They were they were involved in this in the 80s and 90s. So um, I decided to um, basically go and speak to um, who was a retired bishop at the time, Edward Daly. He was famously the priest who was um, shown in the footage of Bloody Sunday um, waving a red handkerchief when they were carrying one of the, the boys who was uh, shot dead, who was a friend of mine actually, mm. Jackie Dotty was his name. And I went to him and told him the story and he said, well, you know, the days of priests covering up stories of abuse are gone. So he said, I'll have to report this to the police, which he did do. Um, he made contact with a detective that he knew in Liverpool and um, he then subsequently made contact with the Metropolitan Police in London. So the police in London uh, flew me over for a series of interviews and I basically, for the first time in all those years, told them exactly what had happened. Um, one of the days they drove me around the various locations where the abuse had taken place. And um, a lot of people then, including the police, were telling me, you should write this down, just write a brief account, you know, if it ever goes to court. You can have um, your memories down on paper about what happened. So I was getting advice from the police and my own doctor was saying it and I was receiving counselling at the time as well. And the, everyone was saying, just write down an account. So I started doing more and more research on what had happened. Um, and I wanted to know who actually owned this arcade. It was actually behind all this. Um, and I was interviewed um, by the BBC uh, for one of their uh, sort of premier radio shows um, and that generated a lot of publicity and I think I mentioned in that that I was going to actually write a book about what had happened and once that interview was broadcast then some things started to kick off again um, I received a phone call from my credit card company saying that my details had been compromised um, uh, and that there was some suspicious activity on the card um, and then um, sometime after that my house was actually burgled um, this was in June of 2015, as I recall. So the house was burgled, and um, the, I had a home study which was wrecked. Um, there was a filing cabinet broken open. Uh, some of the research material I had was removed. And there was actually a small safe. I had a small uh, wall safe, which was completely ripped out of the wall and taken away as well. So there was some sensitive information and details that I had gathered um, about some of the people involved and indeed some of the um, information that I had received about them um, in the intervening time. So I decided to go ahead. The police obviously investigated this break-in and they said, well, there's nothing they can do about it. There were no leads, there was no evidence and so on. So that was the end of that. Um, and I continued to write the book. But then out of the blue the following year, um, the police arrived at the house with a warrant, um, basically saying that they had... Um, intelligence now they wouldn't say what this intelligence was but they said that they had intelligence that linked my home to um, indecent images of children so they searched the home uh, and they took a computer that i had and a laptop and some phones now the interesting thing is when my house was bur bur burgled the first time everything was left they took the safe they took jewelry um some papers and bits and pieces the only thing they didn't take was the desktop computer or the laptop or an iPhone and some bits and pieces. However, in this case, the police took everything that they hadn't taken. Um, so I was bailed and continued to write the book. And then a year later, I went in for an interview with the police, with my solicitor. And they basically said that they had um, discovered 11 indecent images on my computer. 
and could I explain how they got there? So I said, well, I have no explanation uh, how I knew nothing about it. Um, but an interesting um, event happened. They said to me, have you ever seen um, child pornography? And I said, well, as a matter of fact, not only have I seen child pornography, which was shown to me in 1975, I said, I actually witnessed children being sexually abused. And the police officer interviewing me didn't bat an eyelid. You know, you would have thought they would have asked, well, who was involved in this abuse? Were you involved in it? Have you got the names of the people? Because for all they knew, these people could still be alive. Mm. But they just went right back to the issue of these and the alleged indecent images. Um, so my solicitor had said, because they obviously had done a forensic examination, you know, they had an IT expert examine the computer. And normally, if this is the case, they can tell you if you don't download or distribute um, indecent images, they know exactly right down to the second when these were sent, when they were arrived, when they were stored on your computer. And my solicitor said, when were these actually uh, downloaded? So he shuffled through the, this forensic report that he had and said, well, we don't actually have that information there. So my solicitor said, well, maybe it would be important if you could find that out because it could be that Mr. Daly possibly was out of the country when these alleged images were downloaded. So um, the interview ended. I was released again on bail. And then um, subsequently another year passed and I got a phone call to say that they wouldn't be pressing charges. So I have no doubt that all this thing was contrived basically to stop me writing this book about the abuse of power and to stop me naming some of the people involved in the abuse. But I said, Let me ask you something real quick, because you mentioned yes. before that the police in Liverpool went to all the effort and expense to fly you over there to interview you about these crimes, which is unusual, right? Now, but uh, did anything come of that investigation? Um, no, nothing. They basically contacted me. Um, I mean, they kept in touch after a number of uh, months, but they basically said, well, we're, we have no leads. One of the things they did say was that um, they interviewed all our people who were around Piccadilly Circus in the 1970s, and they said some people have named this guy called Keith, who was Keith Hunter, was the guy that sort of started speaking to me in Piccadilly Circus. And they said, if we have any photographs, would you be prepared to come over and help identify him? And I said, certainly I would. But, I mean, I heard no more of them. The phone call, they said that everyone that I had named was now dead. And as such, there was no there was no point in investigating further. That was the end of the story, as far as they were concerned. And off there, you were telling me, too, that uh, the, the Playland uh, uh, video game store was owned by the people who owned the Sega video game uh, company? Yeah. This is an interesting yeah. um sort of American connection, which your listeners may be interested in. Um, there was never anything in the papers about who actually owned Playland. Um, so I decided to look into this and did a bit of research. And I came across this name of a guy called Martin Bromley. He was actually born in New York in 1919. And his father was involved. His father set up a sort of a gaming machine, jukeboxes and slot machines and one-armed bandits and so on. Um, <clears throat> now, Martin was um, actually drafted into the Navy in the early 1940s. And he was in Pearl Harbor uh, during the bombing. So during that time, he had made an awful lot of contacts. And after the war, he created a company called Service Games. And then after a few years, they decided to shorten the name. They took the SE from the service and the GA from games and called the new company Sega, which subsequently became a big, big company. And I think parts of it were sold for about $10 million to um, some various American conglomerate. But in 1947, Martin had actually been convicted for possessing illegal gaming machines in San Francisco. Hmm. And in the year after that, he was convicted of robbery. So... Martin Bromley was basically involved in using his Navy contacts to move machines to various military bases around Japan, the Philippines and Guam and various bases in the, the Far East, um, all illegally, of course. And when this came to the attention of the authorities, the American, sorry, the Navy actually banned them from and fined them for having anything more to do with the military. And then shortly after that, he decided to leave and he came to London um, and he set up a syndicate, but was basically buying up land and property in London. And that's when they opened um, Playland and a lot of these other amusement arcades. He actually owned most of the amusement arcades in London. 
Um, and at the same time then, he was um, taking advantage of the Vietnam War. He got involved in business there, and he was leasing amusement machines to the, um, the army in Vietnam and expanding into importing booze and frozen pizzas and all sort of stuff for them. Um, but by the time Saigon, Felly had made an absolute fortune. Um, but that's who was actually behind this, um, who owned the Playland. And I'm not saying that he knew personally that there was a rent boy operation operating from it, but there was a small London gang who, who definitely were operating out of um, Playland. And I'm sure the local management must have known something. Um, what about the other uh, video stores that he owned, the other arcades? Any trafficking going on at those locations? Very possibly, but there's no information. There were certainly no no court cases. There was a big investigation actually carried under the Playland um, arcade, um, and five people were actually prosecuted because of it, including the guy who raped me. Um, but there were a lot of, um, I don't know, string pulling behind the scenes because the arcade never closed down hmm. in spite of these. And it was this was about the third scandal involving Playland. So it just seemed that um, there was some money behind the operation and for whatever reason it wasn't closed down. But then things came to a head um, in 1980 because it transpired then that um, this Bromley's organization were evading tax. They weren't, um, they were basically downplaying the amount of income that was coming in through all these amusement arcades and they weren't paying tax. So it turned out that they owed 10 million um, in tax to the government. It was the biggest tax avoidance scheme, I think, in, in um, UK sort of history. So Martin and his associates were all arrested and then bailed. And there was a very unusual deal done then the following year where he basically signed a check for about two and a half million in court handed it over to the tax man and that was the end of the matter so the thing was then after that the tax that the playland was actually shut down because of this financial but but funny enough not because of the sexual abuse of children over all these years yeah, it's like the old al capone story you know they got him for taxes rather than yeah you know, all of his yeah crimes. and martin was actually yeah he was subsequently found dead in his bed in zurich um in 2008 um that was well, allegedly that he, he died of an overdose of um viagra hmm. but um there you have it now, now you, you mentioned a, a lot of uh, elite uh, businessmen yes. and uh, politicians w what about celebrities there were a few celebrities. I mean, when I was in um, Playland, it was based there. I seen some celebrities coming and going. I had no direct dealings with them myself, but some of them were were regulars in there. They were people who we'd have seen on British television, for example. Um, some of them are still alive, so I can't say too much about that. But there were all sorts of people who who used Playland. Most of the people in the know who went to Playland. They didn't go there to play with the machines. They went there to play with the boys, mm -hmm. unfortunately. And you mentioned, too, that in your arrest that you had an iPhone. So this was just recently, right? What year was this? Oh, this was um, 2016. 2016. It was, it was actually my wife's phone. I just had an ordinary Samsung, which sure. they, they took as well. Now, have, have you had any other kind of threats or, or intimidation since 2016, since that arrest? No. no. Well, everything um, stopped after the book was published. I mean, two months after the book was published, that's when I was told that they wouldn't be taking any uh, further, um, they wouldn't be pressing charges. What about attempts to bribe you, to pay you off to stop talking on the radio? Uh, no. No, 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 it's pretty real. <laughs> that hasn't uh, happened yet. Okay. All right. So, so let's take a little commercial break. We're here today with Anthony Daly, Tony Daly. The book he's written is called, uh, let me pull this up real fast. It's called... Um, the Abuse of Power, A True Story of Sex and Scandal at the Heart of London's Elite. Basically, a story about how when he was a young man, he traveled over to London and uh, got caught up with a bunch of uh, human traffickers, uh, blackmailing him and uh, threatening his life, beating him up and, and raping and molesting him. Now, Anthony, you grew up in Northern Ireland during the time of the Troubles, which must have been highly traumatic, all the bombing going on around you. Yeah. And then you went through this other uh, trauma, uh, with sexual abuse and w witnessing little boys getting raped right before your eyes, yeah. getting beaten up, blackmailed, arrested. Uh, you've had a life of serious trauma. How do you deal with all that? Yeah. Um, the first thing I should mention is that after this happened, when I returned to Ireland, let's say for about 1979, after I got married, 
um, I really put this all behind me. I didn't even think about it. And it didn't, funny enough, it didn't torture me over the years. Um, it's like life just sort of, um, it covers up the past in some mm. ways and you become much more focused on your wife and your children and your career. And that's was really the focus. Um, I was I, Thankfully, I was 20 years old and I thought I was able to cope with it okay. I mean, one of the things that I um, feel really sorry for is young children who this may have happened to them. They were a lot younger, obviously, and sometimes over a longer period. And that can be truly traumatic. Um, and I really feel sorry for the children involved. Um, it was bad enough for me, um, age 20, and it happened in a relatively short time span. Um, so I was able to put it away, but only until these stories then of abuse started appearing and becoming more high profile um, on the television. That's what really triggered it all off. But it's interesting you say about dealing with this, because when I was interviewed by the Metropolitan Police um, once I had given the statements and they recorded everything, and I have to say that they were completely professional about it and, and sympathetic, they actually said to me, you're going to need to get counselling to deal with this. And I said, no, I'm absolutely fine, I'm OK. But they said, "This is you, you won't put this toothpaste back in the tube. You're going to have to confront and deal with this. And it was only when I returned home after that that I started feeling, in one day in particular, I arrived home and the house was empty. And, and this flash about um, taking my own life just travelled through my head for like a few seconds and I was immediately embarrassed about it that I would have had such a thought. So I phoned an organisation called the Nexus Institute and did arrange to have counselling. So over the next 10 weeks um, I met a counsellor and sat down with her and told her everything that had happened and talked about the past. And, um, and I have to say, she didn't say very much, but she let me talk and tell the story and think about it and reflect about it. Um, and what was happening at that time was that I was seeing these images of some of the things that had happened really playing on a loop inside my head. You know, I could have been sitting at work um, on a computer, but I was actually looking past the screen, looking into the past and seeing what was what was happening. So she said, you know, you, you've left this 20-year-old in the past and you need to find some way of rescuing him and bringing him forward. You need to confront this and actually deal with it. So that was really, really useful. But And she said as well, why don't you try writing down, just write down an account of what happened and it might help you to be cathartic and come to terms with um, you know what you've been through so that's exactly what I've done when you were uh, arrested do you believe that the arresting officers were involved directly or were they unaware of, of how you were set up um, to be honest I don't actually know but there's here's one interesting um, aspect of the story the man that uh, took me under his wing, Sir Simon Hornby, who in some ways I looked at him like a father figure. I mean, I admired him. He was a very intelligent man. He was a businessman. He was actually the director of retail for W. H. Smith, was a chain of the biggest booksellers in the UK at the time. Um, and we talked about all sorts of things, literature, music, um, art, history, and so on. Um, and he actually gave me a book called The Romance of a Bookshop. It was an old antiquarian book, but it had been published in the 1930s, and it was actually about the setting up of Foyd's bookshop where I worked. And he signed it um, to Anthony with affection and S. Hitch with a, an X on it. Now, I had kept that book because it was important physical evidence. It was one of the things that, that, that wasn't lifted in the, the Army raid in 1976 because I had it wedged among hundreds of other books that I had. But during the search, um, the more recent search uh, that they are, the, the police raided the house. After the raid, um, I started looking around the house and I had a, a searched my study for this book and I couldn't find it. And not only had the book disappeared, but there was a, an envelope with old family, black and white family photographs, and that had vanished as well. So I complained to the what's called the police ombudsman. It's like an organisation that processes officially complaints against the police. So they um, allocated an officer who investigated the whole thing. He came out and interviewed me and took down a lot of notes. And he said, I've already contacted the police. And they said, there's, there's no way they would have taken photographs or a book from my home. So during the course of his investigation, he actually visited the, uh, the, the police station, the evidence room, hmm. and asked to see the stuff that they've taken out of my home. 
And indeed, there there was, he found an envelope with the family photos that I had told him. But I said there was no sign of the book. So he then interviewed the officers involved in the search. And the officer who actually lifted and put the photographs in said, I didn't realize there were, I didn't realize it was photographs I was putting on. I thought it was CDs that I was lifting. Um, and he denied any knowledge of the book. So he claims that it was an accidentally lifted the photographs. And the senior officer who then was logging the evidence said he didn't notice that either. So the, that book has actually vanished, and that was an important part of physical evidence. Um, I mean, the, the police basically said they were working on intelligence that they had received. And I asked them, I said, well, where did this intelligence come from? But they wouldn't tell me. In fact, they wouldn't even tell the police ombudsman. They wouldn't reveal their sources, and they wouldn't say what the evidence was. So it was all very, very secretive. Is there any chance that they can reopen that case and charge you again? Um, very possibly. I mean, if they could come across and say, well, we have further evidence now, we have something else, we found something else, um, and we're going to press charges again, it's it's entirely possible. Yeah, cause that's another very stressful thing in life, having a case hanging over your head for years. It's a yeah. really another miserable aspect to all this. Now, you mentioned yeah. uh, a lot of uh, uh, powerful politicians and stuff like that. Any names we would recognize? I can, you, you probably won't recognize them um, in the new USA, but there was one um, one of my clients in particular, a man called um, Sir Michael Havers, and he's of interest because he subsequently went on to hold the highest legal officer in the United Kingdom. He became the Attorney General, and he was also well known for um, prosecuting the Guilford Four. I'm not too sure if you're familiar with that case. No, I'm not. But essentially, in, in 1974, the IRA bombed a couple of pubs in uh, Guildford. It was an atrocity. There were a number of people killed and maimed. But four um, Irish men were arrested. And although they pleaded not guilty, they said there's no way they could have done it. Um, they were set up. The whole trial was configured to find them guilty. And it was, a, it was proven to be one of the biggest miscarriages of, is of justice. So this guy, um, Michael Havers, was prosecuting. He was a member of the cabinet, and he was prosecuting um, them at that time. Um, and indeed, when I was being um, forced in London, they were basically saying the Guildford Four could become the Guildford Five if you don't do what you're told. Wow. So he prosecuted the Guildford Four, and he also prosecuted another family who were completely innocent, called the Maguires. And they served many, many years in prison for a crime that they did not commit. Um, there was actually a, an IRA active service unit in London at that time who were committing the bombings. And in fact, after these people were arrested, the bombings continued using exactly the same pattern. So it was clear that they didn't have the bombers. But it was basically just to say to the public, we've got these people. But Sir Michael Havers in particular prosecuted that case. And as a barrister stood up and presented false evidence, he suppressed alibi evidence. Um, it was awful. So he was one of the clients involved. Now, um, he um, featured more recently on some of the information that I came across because I was um, received um, anonymously a memo that had been circulated at the Old Bailey at that time. This was during the, the trial of the Guildford Four. Basically, it was two of the officers in the Old Bailey were had expressed concerns about Sir Michael Havers taking an interest in the Playland trial which was also being prosecuted uh, at the same time in a different courtroom. So they expressed some concerns about that. That was one of the documents that was actually in the safe when it was stolen, a copy of that memo. Um, so then um, I came across a book written by a journalist called Chapman Pincher. Um, I would recommend that you Google him. He was a very interesting character. But he had the ear of many, many uh, members in government, and they often leaked information to him. He was probably one of the most well-informed journalists in the UK for many years. And he was a good friend of Michael Havers, and Michael Havers was told him a number of indiscretions over the years. But um, in the 1980s, uh, Chapman Pincher was accused of being a Russian spy, incredibly, along with another guy called Lord Rothschild. Um, it was nonsense, of course, but I think they just wanted to shut him up. Um, so when the, pre the police came and they interviewed him for about 12 hours, he says in his book that I made sure that they left with a fat folder marked Havers. Mm. Um, if they were going to 
press charges and take me to court then I would have to disclose everything that was in this folder about Havers and it would probably lead to um, a senior member of the government resigning and it would be a, a field day for the opposition, the Labour Party at that time. So after a short while um, he was contacted and he was told that they wouldn't be pressing charges um, and they returned the documents. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, I then, on the basis of that, requested a freedom of information, a request to the Metropolitan Police, and I said, please, can I have a copy of these documents that you photographed out of the Pinchers file? Um, and after a number of months, they came back, and they listed four or five exemptions. They say that they couldn't release it and that they um, they couldn't even they couldn't even confirm if Michael Haver's name was in the documents. So that was um, another aspect of this that was closed down, that they, they wouldn't even give the information about Havers. But then I was, um, <coughs> excuse me, I'm going to take a drink of water here. Sure. Um, shortly after that um, request to the Met, I received another document in the post. It was actually posted to the Republic of Ireland and then forwarded on to me. So I don't know who it came from. But I believe it was one of the documents that I had asked the Met for. And it was an internal memo. Thus, Sir Michael Havers. And it basically said, there's intelligence that leads us to believe that um, Sir Michael may have been involved with a rent boy, which might explain his interest in the Playland trial. And there were grave concerns that if this became public, it could lead not only to the collapse of the Playland trial, but also the big high-profile Guildford 4 trial. Um, so it talks about um, this um, alleged rent boy from Northern Ireland coming over to London and associating with um, VIPs at that time. And it also talks about um, this information being passed to the Prime Minister of the day, who was Harold Wilson and Margaret Thatcher, who was the leader of the opposition, and also the Home Secretary. So um, <clears throat> the shocking thing is that when I was in London being um, abused and pimped out to these um, politicians and prominent business people, the authorities knew about it. It could well be that, I, I mean, I have no doubt now that I was under surveillance at that time. And I sometimes wonder, um, was I actually being set up to um, make contact with these people uh, so that they could subsequently be blackmailed. Yeah. You know, could some of these politicians be said, we have information that you were associating with a rent boy and this is the way we want you to vote against a certain thing. So they could have been maybe set up for blackmail at that time. So um, it's a deep and murky um, circumstance all around, I think. Fascinating story, my friend. I tell you, you've lived some life. Uh, the yeah. book is called um, uh, The Abuse of Power, A True Story of Sex and Scandal at the Heart of London's Elite. And it's under the name Anthony Daly, D-A-L-Y. You can find it on Amazon. Mr. Daly, we're out of time. What would you like to leave us with? Um, that's, a, that's a very <laughs> profound question. I know. Um, I mean, the one thing that I brought in my story is that there, my story is one of redemption, that uh, no matter what you can through, be it, um, you know, I've been through the troubles in Northern Ireland, the sexual abuse, the subsequent attempts to try and shut me up when I was writing this book, that I believe that it's, um, it's always good to have faith that, there, that things will come right at the end and that there's, um, it's important to get the truth out there. You know, there's, there, there's, no, there's no rest without justice, and I think that's the important thing. Truth and justice overrides any considerations. Amen. Amen. I, I definitely agree with you there, and that's, that's why we do this show. We try to get the, these facts out there that people aren't aware of. Anthony Daly, thank you so much. Once again, the book is The Abuse of Power, A True Story of Sex and Scandal at the Heart of London's Elite, and uh, great reviews on Amazon. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Good night.